Thank you for taking the time for slowing down and just taking these few minutes to think with me about the subjects that we find in Romans. Today it's Romans chapter 7. And let me begin by asking you the question, how do you enjoy some of the forces that are at work on you in your life every day? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, some are bad and some are good. Some are just there and we become so used to them we don't really think about them. Take gravity, for example. It's a very crucial, essential force that is on every human being and everything. I mean, unlike living in space where gravity is less and things float around, you and I don't need to worry about, well, should we get out of bed in case we might just float off? Or when you turn the tap on in the bathroom and you think about washing your face, you don't need to worry about, well, will the water, will it, will it just all of a sudden just float into the atmosphere as if you were on the space station? No, you and I have become so used to this force that is a force that makes our lives, it's for good, you could say, it makes our lives meaningful. It's part of the very fabric or the very essence of what it is to be in this universe. Now there's a whole host of other scientific physics sort of stories behind that that I couldn't go into knowing where my physics went in my lower six one month and that was it over. But I do know the experience of force is good. But then there are other forces at work within us. You and I know the power in our hearts, the power for love and compassion or, or the desires that we have. Desires for certain things. Desires for ourselves. You know how important yourself is to you. And you know how strong the desires associated with your own self as a person are. Protecting yourself, asserting yourself, loving yourself, making sure that you get self-justification and all sorts of things. Self, self-independence, the autonomy. That's a force. Not a good force, but a force nonetheless. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 7. He says, and I would imagine, just to parenthesis this, that Paul is someone who has lived a life, at this stage he has been a believer for maybe two decades. He has been through so much. He has such a mind. He has thought it out. He has taught it out. He has suffered for it. And this is what he says. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now that's the English Standard Version, but let me read it to you in the New Living Standard because I think it just sometimes helps. Here we read, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Paul says that he is most aware of this when he wants to do the good. He says, when I want to do right, Evil lies close at hand. Or again in verse in the New Living it says, When I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I think that's a very comforting statement to read. Because I'm sure that you experience something like this. If you are a, an honest Christian, you want to pray, you want to read your Bible, you want to take time to be alone with God. Or maybe you want to respond to a situation or a need. Maybe you've heard about some need and you think, I would, I, I, I would like to do that. I should do that. I should help that person. I should send them a gift or I should contact that person to encourage them. I should write them a card or whatever it may be. And yet, 
how easily distracted we become. We can hardly stay focused in prayer for more than a few minutes, and yet we can watch the television for hours on end. Banal, unthinking TV. Or if we think of joining a small group for Bible study, then we find a thousand excuses. This reality of this warfare is, is, is what we're talking about. This is the struggle within us. And this struggle is the very evidence of the life of the Holy Spirit within us. Before we are Christians, we don't have this struggle. We more or less just go with the flow of our own inclinations and desires. But when we have decided to go against the force of sin within us, we meet resistance. Because the sin really hates God, anything to do with God. And we will experience this in many ways. Do you never find thoughts, very angry thoughts against God in your heart? Do you never find yourself saying to yourself, Oh God, that's not fair. Why God? And you're far too strict. Or oh, you let that person away with something. And or do you not find so many twisted stories of the truth go on in your mind? This is sin's power within us. Now Romans 8, where we'll have a look at next week, will give us hope and more answers. And it speaks, that chapter, more about the Holy Spirit than any other chapter in Romans. This force of power of sin within us does have some rewards, doesn't it? It's what the Bible calls the pleasures of sin, because it employs these as well, this power of sin employs these kind of rewards. Maybe you remember Moses, where you read about him in Hebrews 11. It says this, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Do you notice there he describes the fleeting pleasures of sin? The context, contest in his life is between, and I quote here from Chris Lundgaard, a little book I'll mention in a moment. He says, The contest was with the law of sin and the law of grace. The reward offered to Moses by sin must have been great. Honour with the Egyptians, wealth beyond anything he could see among the people of Israel, Intellectual delights of debating with the top minds in Egypt, essential pleasures of the food and women and entertainment. And Hebrews 12, and I end the quote there, Hebrews 12 says, doesn't it, that sin so easily entangles us. Well, Moses not only experienced the rewards of sin, they were there before him, he could see them, he could feel their, their, their attraction and their magnetic pull upon his life. But he also experienced the power of grace because it offered rewards as well. It says that he rather chose to be mistreated with the people of God because he was looking to the reward. Yes, the reward. Something greater, something better. Something that he was prepared to experience the delay in getting because it was worth waiting for. Yes, so, when God's grace changes our nature, it doesn't change the nature of the flesh, but it mortally wounds it. Yet sin will have a constant pressure upon us all our earthly days. And isn't this indeed one of the great attractions of heaven, where we're freed finally from sin's presence, gone completely? And yet, the very things that God's grace gives us to fight sin's power with, they will be the things that sin will try to destroy and deceive us into setting aside. We call them the means of grace, prayer, reading and meditating upon the word of God and reflecting on it, worship that's private and public, including the sacraments, and perhaps fellowship with God's people too. The gift of our mind that's one of God's great gifts, the watchman of our souls. We need to feed the mind with truth and meditate upon the word with God's help. And then let that shape our prayers. And then our prayers might become more powerfully directed at the sources of need and the true enemies of our soul. Because truth informed prayers make sense. The little book that I find helpful in this whole subject is a book called The Enemy Within, published by PNR. It's written by Chris 
Lundgaard, L-U-N-D-G-A-A-R-D. You'll find this to be a great help thinking about this whole struggle of what's going on within our lives. So I hope that these few thoughts that I'm giving you, not an exposition of Romans 7, but some thoughts to stir your mind and stimulate your heart, will maybe help you as you experience the force of the power of sin in your life today. Remember that by the grace of God, you and I can turn and we can go against the flow. It will not be easy, but it will certainly be worth it.